good. So we're in the new 757 notes number 10 PDF, um, which has a um, page 236 at the top of it from the old. Um, that's from the old 757 class. Note sequence. Um, and this is a, uh, a lecture on a, on a great paper that I worked with uh, back when I was doing my thesis on um, uh, signal noise separation and uh, the enhancement of, of signal. So the, um, the paper is a, a, a real, uh, um, it's one of those papers that you, you, know, you look back in your volumes of, uh, of geophysics. And I think even as I, as I recycle all my journals, um, this, uh, um, this, this, uh, this month, which I've got to do uh, before my office buries me, um, this is one of those papers I want to pull out and, uh, and keep for a while. Um, the, uh, the scans that uh, the journal Geophysics has of the, uh, the papers from this, uh, this era, they're kind of, uh, they're pretty much fax quality scans. And I don't, I don't know that they've gone back and, uh, you know, updated their online resources. So the text is all searchable, but the, uh, the figures are, are really crummy um, in the, uh, the sort of early, um, early scans. Geophysics was one of the first journals to uh, be available <coughs> online and, and on disk. And so they, they used, um, you know, 20 year old technology to do their scans. So I'll, I'll, this is one of those great articles that I'll probably pull out because I, I just continue to use it over and over again. Um, and of course, it's by my, um, my academic grandfather and uh, several of my academic uncles. So uh, yet again, um, a, an amazing product of the, of the uh, Stanford Exploration Project. Now, um, working with multi-offset data gives us some new um, abilities to, to talk about noise <clears throat> Um, that uh, we didn't have when we were, you know, just uh, seismologists looking at single, single seismograms. And it's an incredible opportunity and, and brings with it a, a burden that since we have a 2D data field, um, some of our older definitions of signal start to become less useful. Uh, you know they don't exactly break down, but they're they're not uh, they're not doing um, um, they're not doing uh, the job that they should be that we want them to. So very simply, signal is a component of some data that has something that we call coherence. Okay, and it's really this this definition of coherence that. That is the uh, the main um, idea of um, but behind Harlan's paper, Bill Harlan's paper. Uh, noise, conversely, is a component of the same data that doesn't have coherence. You know, doing the double quote fingers, whatever coherence means. So. The, the fact is here, I mean, we thought we knew what noise was. Uh, but the definition of signal and noise depends on how we find the coherence. So let's, let's take up the, the definition that, um, that Harlan, Clairbaut, and Roca put forward. Coherence means a component of data that can be simplified or predicted by some linear operator. And we have this short list now, but it's not a, it's a longer list than we, uh, than we used to have. And, the, and collecting these together as a list is, is an important activity too. 
Okay. So linear operators that we've been talking about here are the NMO stack, the slant stack, zero offset migration, multi offset migration, um, Fourier transform. We know now that all of those are linear operators. Um, and why why are we talking about linear operators? Well, basically, we're part of our definition of coherence and part of how we will identify coherence. Um, depends on there being an inverse. Okay, so uh, now if there are there are nonlinear operators that uh, that do have inverses, but um, even restricting ourselves to linear operators that all, almost by definition, have inverses. Okay, then we. Um, um, we can we can do uh, some pretty interesting things. Okay, we don't have to go to nonlinear operators yet uh, to find lots a whole new world of new nations and and uh, peoples of coherence. Okay, um, so we're going to start to uh, explore this. And like I said, one of the um, uh, one of the objectives of, of this course, as with 706, is that you become very comfortable with uh, large numbers of new linear operators. You know how to define them. You know how to find them. You know how to invert them. You know how to transpose them. Uh, you know what their, um, their impulse responses are. And now I'm going to explain something about um, the definition of coherence that each of those linear operators brings. All right. So, so suddenly, suddenly, signal and noise is not in the least obvious anymore. Okay. Um, it depends on on what kind of coherence we're using, how we're defining coherence, and that depends then on which linear operator we're talking about. All right. Downward continuation. There's another one. Um, you know what is coherent to downward continuation? Um, Stolt migration. There's another one. Um, okay. So uh, let's think about uh, what defines signal um, within data. Okay. And it depends on which linear operator. All right, and as I as I said for the slant stack, a linear operator finds the semblance, okay, of a certain kind of coherence. So the NMO stack, right, it identifies hyperbolic arrivals. For the in the context of the NMO stack of that linear operator, hyperbolic arrivals are signal. And then conversely. Anything else is noise. Okay, and I actually showed you an example of that, where I was looking for hyperbolic arrivals underneath linear arrivals. And usually, you think those linear arrivals, those surface waves, those air waves, those are perfectly coherent. No, they're not. Not to the NMO stack. Okay. All right. So you ask, but I thought I thought linear arrivals were were coherent. Yes, they are to the slant stack to the p-tau stack. Linear arrivals are the signal. To the, to the slant stack, uh, linear arrivals are, are not. Um, uh, linear arrivals are not. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, hyperbolic arrivals are not coherent to the, um, uh, to the NMO stack. All right? Zero offset migration. What's coherent to that? Diffractions, hyperbolic diffractions. Okay. So uh, uh, linear arrivals are noise to to zero offset migration. Okay, and hyperbolic diffractions are signal to the zero offset migration linear operator. 
so now you know our definition of signal and noise is extremely context dependent. And until we define what operator we're working with, and if we have a new operator, we have to figure it out, we don't know what's going to be signal to that and what's going to be noise. But how about this? Okay, now that we have 2D data, you know, with, with, a, with 1D data, with single seismogram, basically all you can do is, is, is use the Fourier transform to find out how, how coherent it is in the context of sinusoids. Right? You see a, a, a strong peak in its, uh, in its spectrum, you know, sitting uh, two sigma above the, uh, the noise, and you say, okay, that's, uh, uh, that's a, uh, a coherent wave in that signal seismogram. Okay, and we can do that with 2D data too. But now that we have two-dimensional data fields, and three-dimensional, of course, five-dimensional, as we've talked about, we can talk about coherence in many, many new ways. We can talk about signals in many, many new ways. And we have now the ability to separate certain kinds of signal from other kinds of noise at will. And we can do it in, in many, many more ways than we used to be able to do it. So um, uh, these linear transformations are giving us a way to extract the kind of signal that matches their semblance. All right. So for the 1D Fourier transform, the semblance is a sinusoid. Um, for uh, multi-offset migration, the uh, uh, in in uh, in three-dimensional uh, variable velocity, the semblance is going to be some kind of uh, heavily scattered, heavily bow-tied um, hyperboloidal diffraction in the five-dimensional data space. Um, so data uh, are equal to signal plus noise, right? So D is uh, is equal to uh, S plus N. I guess I have to go and uh, pick the correct tool. All right. So D is equal to signal plus noise, and um, uh, we after the transform, whatever it is, Fourier transform, um, uh, five-dimensional uh, um, Kirchhoff migration, whatever it is, then uh, capital the transform data, capital D, is equal to the transform signal plus noise. Okay, and the the uh, in, in the Bayesian uh, mode, what Harlan, Clairbaud, and Roca did here is that they said, all right, if you start with Gaussian noise, which is not quite white noise, but it's certainly random, uncorrelated noise. Remember how we define noise in, um, in uh, 757, I mean, I'm sorry, in 706, right? We were defining noise really with respect to the Fourier transform. So it's non-sinusoidal. In fact, it's not predictable from one time to the next. Okay. Um, now we have 2D, 3D, 5D, 5D data. All right. So when does it look like Gaussian noise? Well, when it's not got the semblance of our particular transform. So the uh, kind of the essential assumption in here is that what is noise to the uh, this particular transform, you know, before transforming will remain uncorrelated noise after the transform. Okay, and uh, I don't know why I used oh probably because my uh, my advisor uh, is uh, is Canadian. I used the uh, the British spelling of focused here. Sorry about that. Um, there should only be one S. Um, 
according to Webster. So uh, notice that the uh, that the signal becomes transformed, and it gets the signal gets focused by the transform, but its noise we don't write a capital N because it doesn't look like it. The no, whatever's noise to that transform, it doesn't look like it transformed. It just stays as noise. Okay, and in fact, the noise is defocused, so it gets noisier, if that's possible. Well, it can't be any noisier than uncorrelated noise, right? So that's why it stays the same. This is an assumption. It doesn't always work, okay? But it's behind these Bayesian uh, analyses that uh, underpin um, this paper. Um, and it, even though it doesn't always work, and it's not going to be strictly theoretically true uh, in, in, uh, in lots of cases, it's still pretty darn useful. Okay, so we're going to accept this uh, this postulate here that the noise uh, doesn't get focused, and we're just going to identify the transformed, separate the transformed signal out of the transformed data. So suppose uh, that we find histograms, probability density functions. Uh, which uh, we used to be able to call PDFs, and we can't anymore. Um, we find histograms of the distribution of amplitude values in some component of the data. All right. So this distribution, this PDF, is called P as a function of the amplitude level x. All right. So the uh, uh, here we have uh, the probability density function of the um, of the data. Okay. In fact, that's this is a capital D. So that's the probability density uh, function of the transformed data with respect to the amplitude level, right? And in our um, in most of our transforms, you know, we start with seismograms that have amplitudes that are centered at zero. They got both positive and negative amplitudes. And in fact, in most of our data sets, most of the amplitudes are are zero. Um, and then uh, um, uh, so the uh, the transform as well will be uh, will be positive and negative valued and probably still centered around zero. Okay, since we're dealing with uh, with seismic phenomena here and uh, band limited seismic recordings, that's really you know if you're dealing with a GPS time series, well then it's not uh, it's not uh, uh, limited to zero. But our uh, seismic exploration band limited uh, um, data. Uh, that's the kind of pro our probability density functions are Gaussians that are centered at zero. Okay, so the probability density function of the uh, transformed data is still going to be a Gaussian centered at zero, and it's going to have the convolution of two probability density functions. All right, and there's the probability density function of the signal. Which is it still looks Gaussian, but it should be sharper. Then uh, uh, it should have more high amplitudes. Okay, so maybe it's uh, it's actually uh, Gaussian with ears, or maybe even it's flat, or or Ga the inverse Gaussian. I mean, ideally, the probability density function of the transformed signal for that ideal um, for that ideal. Um, uh, uh, semblance, okay. Whatever our transform is is semblancing, okay. Um, you know, it's it's going to even look uh, um, it's going to look non-Gaussian, okay. And that's convolved with the probability density function of the um, of the noise, which is a Gaussian as it always is. It's a Gaussian before transforming. It's a Gaussian after transforming. So here's the uh, here's the assumptions that go into it, okay? So uh, uh, you know the data and the transformed data are both composed of signal plus noise, and the noise stays Gaussian. So the probability density function that's always convolved here is a um, is a uh, a Gaussian from the noise. All right.
then we can use the definition of convolution to find, and this is this is basic Bayesian theory, okay, to find the expectation of the signal given the data, okay, the expectation of the amplitude of the uh, of the transformed signal, that's a capital S there, given the uh, the transformed data, that's a capital D down there, and uh, it's this uh, uh, Bayesian um, um, deconvolution here. Okay, so it's a uh, it, it's integrals um, across these. Uh, uh, you can see that's a convolution integral. Okay, normalized by the uh, uh, the probability density uh, uh, of the uh, uh, of the data at that particular amplitude data amplitude value. Okay, so um, uh, you know. Just an application of standard uh, Bayesian theory. If you've ever taken an um, artificial intelligence class, um, you know there's a, a very hard part uh, that comes uh, early on where uh, they hit you with uh, all these Bayesian uh, deconvolutions, and you have to figure out. You have to use them to figure out, uh, uh, you know, what the chance of rain is uh, uh, tomorrow, or what the uh, what the chance of um, um, uh, what the chance is of somebody uh, uh, somebody dying from Ebola or something like that? You know, given a bunch of uh, bunch of of uh, uh, random factors. Okay, so we uh, you know we of course we have we have data. We can transform that data using uh, some trial uh, uh, linear uh, operator. And so the uh, transform data, let's say it's the uh, slant stack, uh, P, capital P bar uh, in terms of P and tau. And then we can find the expected amount of signal at any point in the transform, any combination of P and tau, using this, this uh, uh, Bayesian expectation. <clears throat> and then uh, <clears throat> we can use this, uh, I, I like to use this info together with the transformed data itself to enhance the data, to, to pull out the signal. And I've, I've already showed you one example uh, of that when I was talking about the NMO stack, and I'm going to show you some more. So here's the, uh, here's the procedure. And actually, I've, I've refined this um, into a, uh, uh, an RG uh, script. You know, it's a command line script, but the script is much easier to run than it used to be. Um, and you just feed it uh, RG format uh, um, files that are uh, uh, that are the transformed data. Okay, um, so you um, <coughs> you transform your data. Okay, which I mean that could be anything from a Fourier transform to a um, to a, a five dimensional uh, multi offset uh, uh, laterally velocity lateral velocity variation. Kirchhoff migration, okay? Whatever your transform is, you take your data and you transform it. And so, okay, talking about a, a, a migration, for instance, what we get out is a migrated section, okay? Step one. Then we, we also want to transform the noise, okay? And, and uh, Harlan made it, I mean, who knows which of the three this innovation came from. But they, they made the brilliant, absolutely brilliant suggestion that all you do is, you know, how do you estimate the noise, right? Do you just, you know, crank out a, um, a realization of, of Gaussian noise from a bunch of dice rolls or, you know, calls to a random function? Okay? That's unsatisfactory because our data are band limited. Um, you know, at the very least, when you're, when you're, uh, Making that that Gaussian noise, you're going to want to scale the amplitudes to the amplitudes in your data, and, and you and, and then you you start saying, okay, I got to filter the noise to make it look like the data. No, okay, the 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 best idea I ever heard of, and you know if there were if there were Nobel prizes in geophysics, I think this idea ought to get it. Just take your data. Do something to destroy its coherency, okay, and then um, and then transform that, and you'll get the uh, 
you'll get the uh, transform noise. And it contains all the statistical and, and frequency and amplitude characteristics of your data, because it is your data. All right? And, and they suggest uh, that it's as simple as taking uh, your, your gathers and, and randomly flipping uh, about, you know, randomly selecting about half the traces and flipping the sign of the amplitudes. That's it. That's all you have to do. And then you transform that data and you have a, tr a transformed noise. You know, and it is, I tell you, I've done this a lot, it's Gaussian. Okay? You've eliminated any coherency, any trace to trace coherency. Remember, with the linear operators we're talking about here, um, except for the 1D Fourier transform, everything depends on trace to trace coherency. So uh, if I was really looking for, um, if I was really looking at implementing uh, uh, Harlan's method for um, <clears throat> um, for um, um, for the Fourier transform in one dimension, I have to think about it. You know, how do we how do we best estimate the noise from our data in one D? But when you're um, when you're in two D, it's so simple. You just randomly flip, you know, uh, uh, about half of the uh, um, half of the signs, and that effectively destroys any trace to trace coherency to any of these transforms. You know, whether it be migration or or uh, uh, or the the slant stack, whatever. Okay. Um, So uh, uh, this is a, a, a magical uh, process, as far as I'm concerned. Okay. So um, we go and we find the amplitude histograms of the transformed data and noise, which we now can very confidently um, estimate. Uh, we simply divide the, um, the probability density function of the transformed data by the probability density function of the transformed noise, and that gives us an estimate of the probability density function of the signal. And then we've got everything we need to just loop through uh, the, the sections. You know, let's say we're talking about migrated sections here as the transformed data. Um, and uh, you know, compute this uh, convolution. Okay, we need the, you know, we need the, the value uh, of the, the amplitude value, uh, we need the um, you know so we find that uh, at at you know some place within the, the migrated section. Um, we uh, uh, you know we have the the prob we've estimated now the probability density function of the signal, and we we take its value at that same amplitude value, and then here's the uh, uh, the probability density function of the noise, which we've also you know. With with uh, uh, Harlan's innovation, we've uh, estimated that very effectively. Um, you know, and it's at a, a slightly different amplitude value. You know, according to the convolution, integrate through that, divide by the uh, probability density function of the data at the uh, at that amplitude, at the data amplitude, transform data amplitude, and there we go. Um, that gives us the uh, a, a map, you know, across the migrated section, say, um, or across the p tau uh, uh, field uh, of the level of expected signal, uh, you know, uh, across the section for each part of the transform. And then what I like to sometimes I, I I find it very useful just to plot that section. Now I've got a section that instead of being you know migrated amplitude. It's uh, it's proportion of expected signal. It's a positive number, and um, sometimes I just plot that as a section, you know, for comparison. Um, <clears throat> and uh, and sometimes when I'm really skating on thin ice, when I just don't have enough data, like with these migrations of um, of uh, uh, earthquake swarms, you know, as recorded by seismic stations that uh, that I've been I've been working on. Um, when there's not enough data, 
you know, you find that that your transform is just not enhancing the coherency. Your transform is is not getting any higher amplitudes than uh, than the noise, and you can see that. Okay, so then you know you got to get some more data. Uh, so then uh, uh, another another thing that I love to do is I'll weight the transform by the expectation. Okay. Um, so that gives me a kind of a screened view, you know, an enhanced view of the uh, of say the migrated section. Okay, and then once you have that, if you want, you can invert the uh, the transformed data back into the data domain, right? You can invert from the migrated section back into data and see where your your complex uh, diffractions really are. Okay. So it's a way of exploring data as well. Uh, you know, sometimes I stop right at step five, uh, and sometimes I carry it all the way through. Okay. Now, of course, if you wait too heavily before the inverse transform in that final step seven, you'll get back exactly the impulse response of the transform. Okay. No mystery there. So here's, uh, here's that multi-offset data gather that we saw when we were looking at, um, at, the, uh, uh, at the NMO stack. And uh, yeah, I, I don't know if you can see it. There are some hints of, of hyperbolas in there. But you can see that an awful lot of it, the, uh, uh, the direct arrival, the refracted arrival, uh, there's some kind of S wave in here. There's a Rayleigh wave. There's an air wave. Lots of linear arrivals. Okay, so a uh, a slant stack is pretty um, pretty effective in uh, calling all those out. Um, what are the artifacts? Well, the artifacts of the slant stack process are due to the the cutoffs. Right, we have a strong wave comes out here. And it's cut off because there's no data in this interval between three and four point four kilometers. Okay, and then it's it's it starts up again here. So there's you know these waves are terminated by these uh, impulses. You know the uh, the Rayleigh wave terminated here by just the limits of where we recorded. So those uh, uh, those terminations. Uh, remember the uh, the terminations are are like points. And what's the impulse response of the slant stack? It's a line in the p tau domain. So each of those termination points becomes a line, you know, with a different slope, and a, uh, the slope depends on the offset, and of course it has a different uh, uh, tau intercept time. So tau increases down, p increases to the left here, <coughs> and and so that's the. Uh, <coughs> um, you can see that there's these, uh, you know, sort of um, uh, not really dots, not really points here, but suggestive points. There's also suggestions of points where uh, um, things are, uh, you know, these these linear arrivals are all uh, uh, are all coming about. Um, uh, these linear arrivals are all coming into the slant stack as, as points. They're being enhanced into high amplitude points. Okay. So so then we take this uh, this gather, and I go through and and you know according to the roll of a die, if it's uh, uh, one through three, I leave the trace alone. If it's uh, four through six, on the dice on the die, uh, I I flip the sign of the trace. And then I slant stack it. So here's the slant stack of the uh, of the noise, right? And the slant stack of the noise looks a heck of a lot like the slant stack of the data, but it's missing these points of reinforcement. You know, it's missing all the coherent features. All right. So here's a display of this all positive field, which is the coherence, the expectation of the signal for each point of the slant stack. And I think zero time is actually right here. Okay, so um, and the the uh, the the range of, of p values I used was all positive, 
So I'm not sure there's any negative p values in here. So there's zero time. So we can see things that are coming in, you know, a little bit of a little bit. Uh, you know, if there's a linear arrival and it's coming in, you know, like like this uh, AGC gutter, if it, you know, it, it would stack slant stack in a little bit above zero, and that's in there too. Um, so, you know, this these are uh, increasing p to the left. So these are the slow velocities. That's uh, that's probably the Rayleigh wave. You know, here's uh, here's these. Um, High velocity waves that are still probably direct waves, and uh, a little bit lower uh, refracted waves. Those those are probably S waves in there, and then that's the um, that's the Rayleigh wave. Okay, so we're able, you know, the Harlan deconvolution of the PDFs is able to pull out, you know, the linear features in that in that um, <clears throat> in that uh, um, uh, in that section that are, that gather. Okay, what are the uh, what do the histograms look like? Okay, here's the data histogram. Looks pretty Gaussian. Here's the noise histogram. But after deconvolving it, or or actually uh, dividing it with a water level, okay, um, in this way, <clears throat> the uh, uh, the estimated uh, signal histogram is uh, completely non-Gaussian, right? So the the signal is being built up and is dominating the high amplitudes, and this is showing the the difference, you know, between the uh, the data histogram and the noise histogram, which you can't really see on the plots themselves. You really need to re really need to divide out that, uh, and of course, you know, each each histogram is centered around zero amplitude. So. Uh, I basically multiply these two sections to no. I'm sorry. I multiply the signal expectation by the uh, the slant stack just to you know doubly enhance, right? Doubly enhance the. Uh, uh, this is a nonlinear filter, of course. I'm doubly enhancing the uh, um, the signal, the linear signal in the slant stack, and then I inverse inverse slant stack. Okay, so I weight the data slant stack by the expectation. And inverse slant stack the result, and there's the uh, you know what we expect, the most linear components of that um, uh, of that record. Okay, we've effectively uh, uh, you know gotten a, a good look at them, and I think uh, I did not slant stack at quite low enough a uh, uh, quite large enough a p low enough a velocity. To really bring in the uh, the air wave, uh, it's obvious on the plot, but it's rather small on the um, it's rather small on the um, uh, in, in terms of uh, energy. It's it's the air wave is rather small. Um, although I thought I saw it in here. But uh, uh, apparently, it's not being enhanced. Okay, so if I if I then uh, if I do the inverse, okay, <clears throat> so I, I downweight the data by the expectation, and then the the, the down, take the data slant stack, downweight it by the expectation, and inverse slant stack. This is what I get. Okay, this has got the um, the hyperbolic arrivals in it, sort of. Uh, notice I only slant stack down to um, three seconds, so I'm not recovering anything uh, you know that's near horizontal uh, in the lower three seconds. So there's a you know there's an artifact. Um, yeah, there's a reflection there. Okay, so um, these are the least linear components. Okay, and I can of course tune this. You know how heavily do I weight by this? Uh, by the signal expectation, I can, you know, mix these together. This is a really heavy, heavy weighting. You know, I didn't want there to be much left, and there isn't. <clears throat> um, so, <clears throat> you know, this is useful in a number of ways, right? I can look at the signal expectation, and I can pick right out of here the um, 
the slowness of the of the Rayleigh wave. I can pick out the slowness of the direct wave. I can I can you know which is a much much higher velocity. Yeah. I can pick out the slownesses of some of the uh, reflections uh, that are in here. You know so I can I can do analyses directly in the in the expectation of signal. Um, I can also um, I can examine the uh, uh, the inverse. Okay. Um, sometimes I I I like to uh, just examine the uh, you know if I let's say this was a, a migrated section right full of artifacts. Okay. And I want to I want to try to try to help somebody see um, you know what's the real structure in here. Okay. So I'll just give them the uh, the migrated section of the noise, the estimated noise, and and I'll say, well, okay, in the data migration you see a structure, and you don't see that in the migration of noise, so maybe that's real. Okay, that's another mode that I use uh, Harlan's uh, procedures in. Um, so uh, uh, and sometimes it's useful, you know, with this particular record, maybe it's most useful to uh, take out the most linear components. Uh, you know, you can see I, I've left some, right, and um, and that's allowed me to see some reflections that uh, maybe I couldn't see before. Um, hasn't helped me with the first arrival, that's for sure. First arrival is pretty clear, yeah. So uh, it has help with the reflections. <clears throat> Are there any diffractions in here? Yeah, there's a diffraction in there, so it's helped with that. Okay, so let's look at some other uh, uh, some other transforms, like NMO stacks and uh, slant stacks for downward continuation. Or you know, as as I'm doing these days, pre-stack uh, time migration, quite a bit, and I'm about to try uh, uh, pre-stack depth migration. Okay, um, you know, just by looking at the weights or by weighting without inverse transforming. So here's uh, an example from my thesis where the the linear operator is the NMO stack. Okay, here's the st the standard stack, uh, and this is um, Cocourt Mojave line three. It's it's close to that uh, line five that I showed you uh, uh, that I had migrated in Cantil Valley, Southern California. Uh, this is to the south. Uh, the RAND thrust is up in here somewhere, and then here's a, uh, a 15 kilometer deep mid crustal reflector. Okay, very prominent. Um, you know some. Uh, uh, Structure related to the subduction complex, possibly. Okay, and then here is uh, the stack. Um, you know, so I took the whole uh, uh, data set uh, for that part of line three, and uh, you know, I took every shot gather in there and um, and weighted it uh, and and uh, scrambled it by uh, reversing the sign of about half of the traces and stacked it again. And I got the expectation, and uh, and I, I could show you that, but I'm not. <clears throat> uh, I got the expectation, and then I um, I uh, um, I wait I waited the uh, uh, this stack here by the expectation. Now, what is this? What is this really saying? Okay, the 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 um, <clears throat> you know what am I waiting in favor of here? Okay. Um, the uh, operator here, the linear operator, is the NMO stack, <clears throat> um, and the NMO stack is uh, going to enhance hyperbolas that are at the correct velocity for the data. Okay, they're going to they're they're going to uh, uh, enhance hyperbolas that I have matched with the velocity I've used in stacking. Okay, so so. Um, what this points out is where in the stack that we have the best hyperbolic data, or where we have the best velocities to match those hyperbolas. And you can go back into the uh, into the original data, and you can see 
you know, those hyperbolas there. All right. So on standard stack, you just mean you do it in the stack? Yeah, yeah. This is a really simple, uh, really simple uh, um, <clears throat> um, you know, it's a really simple uh, stack here. Okay. Um, and you can see, you know, where the uh, in the standard stack, the the you know the amplitude of that of that mid crustal reflector is not coming out very strongly. Well, that's even you know that's even pointed out even more. So often, what this does is you know just because of surface conditions, the hyperbolas are, are a variable quality as you go from one midpoint to the next, and. Um, uh, or in this case, this is these are shot gather stacks, so not really midpoint stacks. But as you go from one shot gather to the next, the quality is highly variable. And so uh, you know this is kind of tracing for this reflector. It's tracing the uh, uh, the quality of the of the hyperbolas in pre stack. So what is this doing? This is enhancing the reflections that have the most coherent. Hyperbolas in pre-stack. Okay, so it's a pre-stack coherency measure. It's a pre-stack coherency enhancement. Okay, uh, you know where we where we have the velocity right, and where we have and and the ones that are the most simply hyperbolic, the ones that meet. You know they don't dip. Uh, they they. Um, um, they have a uh, a very predictable uh, normal move out. Now there's another kind that you can do, okay, um, where um, you just take the uh, the stack section itself. This is uh, this is uh, um, the CoCorp uh, uh, Parkfield line, and um, in in uh, Western California. And this is the one that goes across the San Andreas Fault, and that I showed you my uh, pre-stack migration of. Okay, and this is um, um, oh, I should be able to remember his name. Uh, this is uh, a stack from uh, the thesis and paper by uh, my colleague who uh, who worked on this with CoCorp. Um, and they're seeing, uh, you know, here's uh, a little bit of of image in this stack. Of that uh, dipping uh, reflector, of course they don't have the reflector from the bottom of the basin. Um, they don't have the uh, the vertical reflector from the side of the fault zone. Okay, um, there's a, there's a mid crustal reflector there that I didn't uh, uh, I didn't get. Um, so there's a few few more things uh, in there. <clears throat> All right, so now. Um, um, they uh, CoCorp uh, came up with an operator that uses post-stack coherency, so it looks for coherent things in the uh, in the stack itself. Doesn't go pre-stack, right? So it's a it's a it's a, uh, a post-stack coherency operator and works much like the uh, the Harlan process. It's not exactly the Harlan process, but it's based as well on Bayesian statistics and uh, PDFs. Uh, and so um, here is the linear component of the stack. So this is a post-stack coherency enhancement, and CoCorp, uh, uh, you know, did a lot of enhancing of their uh, of their products with this sort of thing. Uh, they also had an automatic line drawing uh, type of uh, procedure, which uh, you would take this product and enhance it even further. Um, so there's that that dipping reflector, which should be here under the the Gold Hill uh, fault zone at uh, at forty five degrees. Um, so uh, uh, <clears throat> this is um, uh, you know what I what I showed in my thesis is a view of what you can do with pre stack coherency. Okay, so I'm using essentially a pre stack coherency filter, and notice it's making the stack itself less coherent. Okay. And then this is what you can do with a post-stack coherency filter. Okay, so you turn this mess into uh, something that is a little bit more interpretable. Um, 
and of course it has all the uh, you know both of those stacks have all the uh, problems that stacks have. Uh, let me go to back to Harlan's paper and show and show you the examples that that he has. All right. So um, here's a uh, a stack. It's obviously a little piece of an industry data set. Okay. And uh, so it's a stack section. Uh, goes from one to one point five seconds and uh, has some range of midpoints, um, and so um, uh, he used a cocorp like uh, post stack uh, coherency filter, uh, and his uh, uh, his deconvolution of the PDFs. So here's the linear component of the uh, of the stack, and. Uh, he took the uh, the stack, right, and in point by point he subtracts the linear component. What's left? Oh, very interesting. What's left look like diffraction hyperbolas. And now you can see this normal fault, right? And there's a diffraction hyperbola, uh, obviously at that termination, but you can't see it because of the strong linear component. You take out the linear component and look at the nonlinear component, and there those hyperbolas are. And, and in fact, if he runs through the uh, stack with a uh, with a migration instead, and and looks, you know, at the pre-migration uh, hyperbolic component and enhances it, this is what he gets. And look at this: at the top of each of the uh, diffra each of the diffractions is a 180 degree sign uh, sign change, or 180 degree phase change. So uh, these are these are no doubt physical. Uh, hyperbolas. Yeah, you can see the phase changes even in the uh, the stack minus linear part. Okay, so then after taking out, uh, you know, so he, he's decomposed the uh, the stack into a linear component, which is very strong, and then a hyperbolic component, which is weaker but still pretty clean, and then what's left? Some kind of noise. Okay, it's nonlinear. It's not hyperbolic. You know, it's uh, it's uh, uh, it's Gaussian to those two operations. Okay, so the uh, the data, uh, which is the stack, is composed of the linear component plus the hyperbolic component, plus for this examination, what counts as noise. Yeah, yeah, because the you know the fault uh, terminations are located at. Uh, at the top of, of these three hyperbolas, and so you can see it's a normal fault. It's probably a Gulf Coast, uh, you know, normal fault. Who knows where? But uh, an amazingly convincing uh, demonstration there. Uh, okay, he's got the hyperbolic component here by stat by um, you know doing his analysis on a um, <coughs> on a um, um, on a migration, and he actually looks at the. Um, he's got this uh, uh, focusing measure here, which keys also off on the uh, the PDFs, and um, so he went through that and calculated the focusing measure for a bunch of different uh, migration velocities, and of course, in such a small section, you could expect to be able to migrate uh, at a constant velocity. Uh, doesn't work. Doesn't work too badly. And uh, you know he got a peak in the focusing measure. This is something I haven't tried, but um, uh, you know could be uh, could be very productive. So um, uh, if you remember from even from my synthetic examples, like the um, the truncation model, you know the 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 amplitude itself the. Uh, uh, the maximum amplitude of the uh, of the focusing. Uh, I'm sorry, not of the focusing measure. The 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 amplitudes of the signal component of the signal proportion. Okay, that was that was not that strongly uh, uh, determinative, but this focusing measure looks better. All right, so that's one nice clean lecture there. And we'll go into number 11 and starting on tomography tomorrow.